Hey, it's Talknosis, and we're back with uh, Dr. Shirley Paulson, who's joining us to talk about another interesting text from the Nagavadi Library and uh, about her course on it. Hi, Shirley. Hi there. I'm so glad to be with you again. Thank you. Yeah, we were saying uh, saying off camera, you gave me access to the course on the, the letter of Peter to Philip. I should mention the text. Yes. Uh, folks, uh, I'll link it up. It's literally just a page or two. So so pause, read the text, and then come back. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'll also send out the, the link for the course because I learned a lot uh, about it. it. It's fascinating how much can be packed into a, a, a very brief text. Um, yeah. You know, I think sometimes if you have a, a Christian background, uh, you're familiar with some biblical texts, you see letter, okay, am I in for, you know, you, you think of the Pauline letters, and those aren't brief. <laughs> so yeah. um, I love Paul. Uh, the, you know, I really love his, the humanness of him. Uh, I wouldn't want to be stuck at a party with him in a corner, you know. <laughs> uh, but but this text, uh, the letter of uh, of Peter to Philip, is uh, the yeah, it's, it's just a page or two. So so treat yourselves, uh, folks. Read it. Uh, uh, come back, and uh, you'll be able to follow the conversation even better. We'll, we'll put a link there. So I, I guess I'll just open up with the question: What is the letter of Peter to Philip? Yeah, well, that's that's you know, it's interesting because it sounds like it would be a letter from Peter to Philip, and actually, it's sort of not a letter, although it starts off with a brief letter and then goes on into something else. So uh, it's a good question to start with. What is it? Well, the, I think the most important thing to say is that it, it is one of the texts that comes from the Nag Hammadi Library. So I imagine that most of your listeners are very familiar with that, but just in case, it's um, that collection that was found in 1945 and in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. It is the, it's one of the texts that's in the Eighth Codex, the second one, uh, second tract in that codex. Um, and so it's a fictitious letter because it was written in the second century. So Peter and Philip were just not around by then. So the point seems to be that whoever wrote this, and we don't know who it was, but whoever wrote it was envisioning what it must have been like for Peter and the disciples to get together in the face of violence. That's the reason for the getting together. And the whole story is about how to deal with violence. So it, clearly there was something going on in the second century that made them feel like they could learn something from the first century people. So they made this story that sounded like it was going on in the first century that could be applied to the second century situation. Yeah. Uh why do you think it's not as well known as some of the other Nag Hammadi texts? Like, you know, the, even maybe people on the street, people of a minor interest, passing interest, they've probably heard of Gospel of Thomas. And those who yeah. uh, are, are a little bit deeper into this stuff that we love so much, they know about the, the Secret Book of John, they know about Thunder Perfect Mind. So why, yeah. why is this text not as well known? Well, I'm hoping after this conversation, that will be taken care of. <laughs> because I think this text is... Terrific, and I'd like for more people to know it. But anyway, and I'm not a specialist in reception history, so I can't really tell you from a very deep scholarly place about this, but I can guess that um, the Thunder Perfect Mind is probably better known because it lends itself so easily to artistic expression. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it's easy for, to some, for someone to paint about it and to sing about it and to put it on... Um, some kind of artistic uh, display. That could be one reason for the Thunder Perfect Mind being better known. The Gospel of Thomas has sort of always been known, even though uh, we didn't have access to it until 1945. Uh, people knew it was there. And <clears throat> pardon me, people thought it was um, r either wrong or something was weird about it because it wasn't in the Bible. So there was suspicion from the beginning. And uh, then when it came became uh, known to people there's been a lot of controversy well is it bad is it good or whatever so i think that's what added to its being better known now too secret revelation of john um you're right i think it takes people who know nagamati kind of to get into that text but it should be known because it's it is the only one that appears three times in the nagamati collection and so it's um probably the most comprehensive of the text in the Nakamari that explains uh, a whole theological basis for some of those important texts. Um, so the letter of Peter Philip is not quite in any of those categories, but I think it sure is important. So I'm glad we get to talk about it. 
Yeah, me too, me too. And and uh, here's one of my famous leading questions, but it, it's just one or two pages long. Is is there really yeah. much there that, that that's enough for a whole course? I think it's just a powerhouse. You know, um, what's interesting about it is that it's thoroughly Christian, as you pointed out, but it's full of surprises and it just requires deeper thinking. Like each line you read, you go, oh, how does that fit with my understanding of Christian heritage or Christian background, or that's a new way to think about it. So it, it's just profoundly um, challenging and also, and I think very important. And I find it very inspiring and encouraging too. So I think there's a lot in that. And I'm, I'm again, I'm really glad we get to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, so can you tell us about your course and what motivated you and Dr. Tosic to, to put it together? Yeah. Um, I, I think we are pretty aware that violence is a big topic in the world today. I mean, just with the American issues with guns. And of course, this we did the course before war broke out in, um, you know, with R Russia and Ukraine. But it, there was just violence going on. There still is violence going on. And um, it just feels like people try to solve problems through war or violence. And so this text is the only one that Hal and I could think about, think of that actually addresses violence, uh, you know, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the New Testament, you think of Jesus as um, teaching love and peace, but you don't think that much about him teaching how to deal with violence. So this is an unusual text that way, and we felt that it was worth really digging into and making it better known. So, so uh, is that, did I answer that question right? I that right. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I think that's a wonderful answer. Okay, okay. And I'm wondering if you can unpack for us, you know, can you tell us about the violence of living under empire that inspired mm -hmm. the letter? Because there's some subtleties here, some information here. I think a lot of people who, who are casual, casual listeners uh, of the show, casual watchers of the show, you know, they're thinking of, uh, the, the idea of these, these vast martyrdoms of early Christians, right? You know, just thousands of Christians being thrown to, to the lions. Yeah. And, and while we know that, that there was persecution uh, of early Christians, it, it seems that these uh, the, these numbers are inflated a bit. You know, scholarship for the last hundred years has, has shown that, you know, the persecutions were, were localized. They were they were smaller than some of the, the later mythological history uh, uh, kind of portrayed. Uh, you know, still the, the, there was, you know, persecution, yeah. but not yeah. to completely underplay it. But, but so I'm wondering if, if, if it's not this sort of mythical uh, violence that, that we know about uh, from these martyrs, what was the violence of, of people living under empire at the time that this was written? Yeah, you're right. There's been new scholarship that's saying, let's get a more realistic picture of what was going on there. Um, and, and the numbers of um, have, have been, I think, had been inflated. But I think the, the bigger picture that we're dealing with is the fact that Rome violently ruled over all the nations that they had conquered. So it wasn't just a persecution of Jews. I think the Jews were specifically targeted because, well, for different kinds of reasons, but I think the main thing we need to realize is that Rome gained its strength and power because of its um, military machine. And it, um, it, the way it went about building itself up was to conquer everybody and then take uh, you know, slave, enslaved people and spread them out all over the empire um, and force on them um, not only just slavery itself, but um, just separating families and communities and then taxing them. So it just was making life miserable and oppressive if you weren't a Roman citizen. So and the Jews were part of that. Yeah. So the, um, the torture... They, to keep power, they just used violence. And so um, it was in, in addition to the uh, crucifixion, they would just um, be um, just violent in all kinds of ways. So like even when the soldiers would win a battle, they were required to rape any remaining enemy soldiers. Wow. You know, so there's just violence everywhere. And the people who were um, enslaved often worked in Roman mines that fueled the Roman cities, cities. So uh, there was just they were living with violence for hundreds of years, and it was just it got, it got to the point of being intolerable, especially at the time I think this text was written. It was just like, where else do we go from here? We they'd lost their 
temple. They had lost their leader, Jesus, long before. And where do they go from here? They're just trying desperately to get out of the oppression of the Romans by then. Yeah. So is this a text that's, that's of its time, uh, a historical curiosity, you know, that, that deals with the violence of, of this specific era of living under empire in these contexts? Or can it, you know, help us deal with violence in today's world? Yeah, that, that's probably one of the main reasons that we decided we wanted to really work on this text, just because I think it is surprisingly relevant. You know, it, it's, I think we got as we studied this text, we thought about how violence seems to have been a way of life throughout the, the world history, that, that people tend to turn to violence to, to gain power and to maintain power. And, um, and yet, it seems that the things associated with Jesus were all about how do you deal with violence. Interestingly, we found that this text is one of the surprises in this text is that Jesus never promises a miracle. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, you sort of get that impression in the New Testament that Jesus is going to fix everything with a miracle. But in this text, there's no promise of any such thing. He's basically saying, yeah, it's going to be tough, but let me help you. And so I think that's a realistic way of thinking about our world today. We're not expecting miracles to come and save us. But we need to have guidance. We need to have some kind of wisdom that will guide us through the violence in a way that we can um, go forward. So that's why I think it's relevant for today. Yeah. So, so you and Dr. Tostig, you, you break down sort of six answers this text has for yeah. living under empire, living with violence, healing from violence. And I was wondering if you could take us you know, through each six, so starting with the first one, which is come together. Yes. It's so interesting mm -hmm. that... Um, yeah, you know, again, I don't think, I can't think of any other text that has like s steps of what to do when you're in trouble. You know, often we think, why doesn't Jesus give us an instruction book on what to do? Well, here, there it seems to be. Now, when I say Jesus, we should, let me just make it clear too, that um, the way Jesus appears in the story is not that he's walking around teaching, but that um, it's a time when they're they're envisioning a time when the, when Jesus had already been crucified and gone. The disciples themselves were struggling with what to do because they thought they were going to be killed. Yeah. So they, when they pray, their prayer is answered with a voice and a light. And so the voice that speaks to them is the voice of Jesus, and it comes in a light. So that's where the instructions come from, is from this voice. All right, so these are the six steps. The first one, as you said, is come together. And I'm going to just sort of say them all, and then let me just speak to each one a little bit of that. Is that okay? Uh, oh, all that's right. wonderful, please. Yeah. All right. So the first one, coming together. The second one is teach salvation in the world with a promise. Mm. The third one is pretty obvious, pray. <laughs> <laughs> the fourth one is don't be afraid. The fifth one is, surprisingly to me, be ready to suffer. Mm -hmm. And the sixth one is, help and heal others. So let me tell you why I think each one of those is surprising and helpful. The first one about coming together is pretty much the, the beginning of the book, which is when um, Peter is calling on Philip to come and join the, the disciples. Evidently, this is a time when Philip had already gone and left the others. And Peter is saying, please come back. We... Our, our master has asked us to get together again. So Philip does come back and they are coming together to deal with the threatened violence going on there. So there's, there's a lot to be said about this because again, the Romans had tried to separate everybody. And by being separated, they couldn't find their, you know, their strength. And so I think we all find that the that enemies uh, try to divide and conquer. So this is a very powerful and important uh, uh, instruction to come together a and it might be inconvenient. It might be difficult, but coming together is uh, the first step for um, this kind of thing. The second one is surprising. Uh, it says, you know, teaching salvation in the world with a promise. Now, I think we have to talk about the fact that salvation doesn't mean today what it meant then mm -hmm. uh, because salvation in antiquity, well, of course it was in, in Greek um, would have meant 
both healing and salvation. So in other words, salvation is not just about sin. It's about helping any situation. The, word, the Greek word sorteria just means helping you, saving you from a problem. So what they're teaching is not how to get over your sins as much as it is, I can give you a promise of something better, something helpful. And in the world, which means not after you're dead, but now. <laughs> so it's a very present and powerful guide for um, helping in the immediate situation. All right, the third one about praying uh, may seem obvious to people who are used to finding some kind of help beyond themselves. You just pray. Um, but the prayer really was interesting in the sense that they prayed to God, but the answers mostly came from the voice, like in a very practical and present sense of the voice or the, the voice of Jesus coming to them. And uh, the, I, what I like about the part about praying is that Jesus kept saying to them, I, I'm with you, I'm with you, which leads to the fourth point, which is don't be afraid. And I, I mean, how do you not be afraid when you're about to be killed? <laughs> you know, it's one thing to say, don't be afraid. And another thing to say, well, yeah, how do you stop being afraid when you're afraid? But the way the voice answers this question pretty much is to say, I'm with you. I'm with you now just as much as I was when I was in the body, as is evident with the light and the voice that was there with them. So the idea about not being afraid is you can't act. You can't do anything if you're stuck, if you're paralyzed with fear. You have to confront the fear and you do so by acknowledging that the that Christ presence is with you all the time. So that's a kind of a helpful thing to think about that you you can't expect to go fight your battles without that kind of presence or uh, without conquering the fear. And then that leads to the next one, which is also challenging. Number five is um, be ready to suffer. I think, again, this is another challenging one um, for people used to, who are accustomed to the New Testament that pretty much says uh, when Jesus is there, he'll solve all your problems. Like if you're suffering, here comes Jesus and it's fixed. But um, in this case, the voice is saying, be ready to suffer. And you think, well, then what good is Jesus if he's going to say, go ahead and suffer anyway? But I think what I get from that is it's saying, um, you have the courage and the strength to stand up to this evil. You're going to do it. You may suffer along the way, but you you love this goodness and the strength so much you're willing to take what it takes to stand up to it. You may suffer, but you're going to do something good. So that's a powerful statement to me, to be willing to put away your own concerns and go do the good that you have to do, which again leads to the sixth and last step, which is to go help and heal others. I, I, when you jump to the conclusion of this story, you that's probably the last thing you think about when you're about to be killed and you're terrified that you're being instructed to go heal somebody else. I mean, what? <laughs> but I think that that's the point is that the voice is saying, <clears throat> this is not about you. This is about how you live in the world. You live in the world by being a help to others who are suffering, who are afraid, who are uh, um, in danger. And by giving of yourself, you are doing what Jesus taught you to do, which is basically to be a light giver. So those are the six steps to go from being terrified to be, having the authority and the strength to go change the story and to be one that's helping to fight the enemy and to win. So there's this middle section with a version of the, I'll say so-called uh, Gnostic myth, uh, but the, the many of our audience will be familiar-ish with, you know, the, yeah, some yeah. versions of it. But, you know, you got the Aeons, Archons, Demiurges, and all that. And uh, so two questions. Uh, uh, the, the first one being, you know, some scholars think that, that this middle section is a later edition, and some scholars don't. Can, can you yeah. tell us about that, about about why why there's this disagreement and why they why they may think that it is a later edition and why some people may uh, think that it is original to, to, to the composition of the text? Well, thanks for asking that question because um, this is one of the reasons Hal and I enjoyed doing the course together because we are on two sides of that story. So um, he 
would he did argue that this section is a later edition that doesn't really belong in the text at all shouldn't be there and i say oh no i think it should be there it's what is necessary so i think i could, I, I mean it would be better if he could speak for himself but i will try to explain his point of view that um he feels that first of all if you read the text without that middle section it seems to make sense all by itself so you don't need to have it in there without uh, destroying the meaning of the text itself um, and also he thinks it just doesn't make any sense so those are his two basic reasons why it shouldn't be there or else it was added later so now from my point of view which is obviously biased because it's my point of view but i i think it belongs there because i think that it's the explanation that ex that well that explains why it works how it, how it's possible to follow those six steps and conclude with going out and helping and healing others so it's a kind of a theological treatise that is the to me the background the the, the basis for why this whole thing works so um you know his goal the, the, the solution to the problem is to become a light giver. And so this middle section is all about explaining what got us into the mess, how you get out of the mess, and how do you become a light giver. So those are kind of the reasons that I, I think it belongs there. But you should be aware that there are obviously two different points of view on that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a myth is, is deliberately kind of constructed to work on a few different levels. But, you know, a lot of people are, are going to read that myth and uh, see it strictly as, as metaphysics. You know, something that happened before creation uh, is in the past, is uh, in a kind of fantasy land of imagination. But can you tell us uh, about how this, this myth might be more about grounded history and lived experience instead of... Uh, just metaphysics, not that metaphysics is ever just metaphysics, but I think you know what I'm, what I'm trying to ask. I think so, and I'm glad you bring that up because I, I think the word metaphysical is a complicated word. Yeah. Um, and as you say, sometimes people think of it as a faraway land, like wishful thinking. Um, but I, I think the way I like to think of the word metaphysics is that it's just a, a way of thinking constructively. And so it doesn't mean that you're kidding yourself or that you're um, not being real about the, the situation you're dealing with, but it's just, you're not stuck with reacting to it a certain way. You can, you have more tools with which to think about a situation. It's a little bit like looking at a math problem and you may say, well, it's impossible to answer that problem. And that's because you don't have enough tools to use to solve the problem. And I think that this, this myth um, or the metaphysical approach is giving you tools to work with. So <clears throat> the, the myth in here is that where did evil come from? And I mean, that's a question that all religions have to deal with. Where, how do you explain evil in the context of trying to live good and trying to uh, acknowledge a good God who loves you? How do you deal with and how do you explain evil? Well, this, the answer in this particular text has to do with if you understand where the evil comes from, then you have, <clears throat> pardon me, then you have the wherewithal to to do those six steps. You can actually learn how, why you're not don't have to be afraid, and why you can take action. So, can I tell you the two basic concepts in there? That okay, please. Yeah. Okay, so the the basic concepts there have to do with the deficiency and the fullness, and so the deficiency is pretty much the, the basis for all the problems. Where did it come from? And the it's an interesting word because it, it seems to imply that there was originally a fullness, that the fullness is the way it was made in the first place. And then something happened that took away that fullness. And then we've been struggling and suffering and having violence ever since then. The fullness then is the uh, the solution to the messiness of the of the deficiency and the fullness is the way the way you remove the way the text says is it's to remove from yourself the corruptness that um when you remove the corruption you're able to find your own fullness and with your fullness you're able to be who you originally were and have the authority then to act on this that's kind of an overview of that little section 
Yeah, perfect, perfect. Well, I, I think we're we're already at the end, but uh, <laughs> we're not really because uh, you should go out and take the course. So, um, <laughs> and, and can, can you tell us a bit about the course? So, that, as we mentioned, it's lectures from you and, and Dr. Hal Tosig, and you know, there's questions that people uh, uh, can interact with, right? You, the, the the that you ask where people can contemplate, take their time. Um, it's, yeah. And it's about three or four hours total. Yeah, about three and a half hours, I think, uh, total. Well, we actually we offered the course in two different ways. Um, okay. One is you can take the course independently, as I think you did. You can just go through the whole thing, and, and there are um, contemplative moments where you can we ask questions for you to stop and think about for yourself, and you write them down and think about them. Um, and then you can also take the course um, in a group setting where uh, um, you study the you go through the video part of it, and then we have a group discussion about it together. And then you so and that can take up to um, six. Well, about six different meetings, I think. You can spread them out or whatever, but you can do it in either way. So the course is actually self-contained in the sense that you can do the whole thing with a um, video or you can join in on, on discussions about it if you want to. Right, right. And I've, I've been flashing, for those watching at home, some people listen as a podcast, uh, I've been uh, flashing earlychristiantext.com, your website. And, uh, and of course, there's actually, can you tell us all the stuff that's on that website? Because there's, there's uh, folks, there's a cornucopia. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Okay. So the website has a list of all the courses, how to register. We have not only the letter of Peter to Philip, but five other courses that I think are interesting. And they have to do with a lot of them have, well, most of them have to do with the Nagamati collection. So we have all the courses in there. I also have um, my own podcast section, which is called the Bible and Beyond podcast. And I talk to different scholars who are specialists in different, um, uh, on different subjects relating mainly to the Nagamati writings um, and, and other extra canonical texts. I do a blog. So, and I sometimes have uh, other guest writers on the blog. Um, I have a section on um, just resources like different kinds of books and websites and things that you can do your own kind of research with and some articles. And um, on and the once a month, we have a discussion group where anybody can come join us and talk to the scholar. So that's kind of the overall view of what's going on on, on earlychristiantext.com. Awesome. So everybody check that out. Uh, our quick commercial is patreon.com slash Gnostic to keep the show going for as little as a, a dollar per piece of media per month. We are uh, putting out more shows per month. We're hoping to get up to eight per month. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that's for everybody. Yeah. So so twice a week. And uh, we don't have any content behind paywalls. Uh, we don't really give you anything in exchange for giving us money. We always, uh, I've been saying this for years on the show, we're always trying to think of things that we can do. Someday we'll crack that nut. I, I have a few ideas I just haven't had uh, time to do. But uh, you do get early access to the show and you can also do uh uh one-time donations at paypal.me slash gnostic um shirley thanks again i, I really love your work uh, i hope you uh, we were talking off air uh the, the the scheduling issues you're busy i'm busy but i i'm really hoping that you'll you'll come back on the show talk about some of your other courses and some of your other work and uh it, it's been a delight as always and uh, everybody the, the links uh earlychristiantext.com is pretty easy to remember but yeah. you know, the links will be in the show notes yeah yeah thank you so much it's so much fun to talk to you. Well, first of all, it's fun to talk to somebody who kind of gets what I'm doing. Often I have to do a half an hour of explaining what, what it's about before we can get to the content. So it's fun to get to talk to you about this. Okay, yeah. No, I, I had a lot of fun too, both with this and our, and our other uh, interview, which I'll we'll also link up. So, Very okay, good. well, we'll okay. take care and uh, right. goodbye, everybody. Thanks so much. Great done. Bye-bye.